Okay, I know I am a little bit late to this party, but in this video, I wanna talk about some of the explicit resource management features that we got in TypeScript 5.2. We are talking about the using declaration and the symbol dispose or async dispose. These are pretty new features, so I haven't actually used these in production myself yet, but I have been talking to some engineer friends about ways that these might be used, and I've collected a couple of interesting ideas and I wanna share them with you in this video. So for each one of these three examples, we're gonna look at an existing example that doesn't have dispose, and then how we can add that to make this a little bit different, hopefully a little bit better. And the first one we're gonna look at is mocking a function here. This is something you might do in a test, right? And so the way this works, we can take a look at how we call mock down here. We have some module, we have a function on that module, and this is what we want to replace it with. We want to replace it with a function that just always returns 10. So you get your mock. Um, in this case, we are calling a different function product, which depends on some. We can check to see the value that we get out of here. We should see it's 10 because we're always returning the value of sum. Our mock object gives us a count of the number of times it was called. And then of course we can reset. And as you might guess, it is this reset function that we're going to replace with our dispose call. So let's take a quick look at exactly what's going on here. You can see that we take some object, we take the key of that object and then a mock function that we can replace it with. We're storing off the original function into its own variable. And then we replace that function with this new function that increments our count and of course delegates to our mock function. So right now we have to explicitly call reset on our mock object, even as it goes out of scope here. And so what I'd like to do is replace this with a dispose function so that we don't have to explicitly call that. Now, if you're not familiar with exactly how this explicit resource management works in TypeScript uh, 5.2 and onwards, I'm gonna show you exactly how it works right here. So we're going to replace our reset function here with a new function, really we're just changing the name, and we're going to call it symbol.dispose. And so now we have this special function that TypeScript knows is meant to be the function that disposes of this work or cleans up any resources used in this object that we're returning here. In this case, we're logging dispose just so we can see that, but then mainly we are overwriting again back to the original value, object.key passing that original function. Now, of course, we're getting an error here that we no longer have this reset function. So we're gonna remove the call to reset. And the idea here is that because the object M has a field on it called symbol.dispose uh, that uses the dispose symbol, then what should happen is as soon as M goes out of scope, which is why we have these curly braces here, once it goes out of scope, that dispose function is called. And so our M object is uh, the variables out of scope, it's no longer accessible, m.dispose or m.symbol.dispose is called behind the scenes for us, and we can restore my module.sum to its original function so that when we call the product call down here, outside of our test, if you will, we should get the actual value. So this x should be 10, we should see the call count of three because we're gonna add four together three times, and then it goes out of scope and we restore module.sum. And so here we see the actual value of 12, which is three times four, instead of the mocked value of 10. If we go ahead and run this, and I just have some commands set up for this, uh, you can see our dispose call is not happening and our reset is not happening. We're never getting 12. And that's because there's two pieces to this. Obviously we need to have our dispose function in place, but also we need to say that we expect disposing to happen by instead of using const m, we say using m. And so we're using this resource m and then we'll get the cleanup when we go outside of this scope. And so now if we run this again, you can see we have our mocked value, our call count, then we have our disposing call. When we call to the product function, we get the actual value instead of the mocked value, which means that our function was restored. All right, so there's a simple example. And I think it would be really cool to have like a fully featured library, something like sign on that embraces dispose like this so that you don't have to worry about resetting mocked functions, those types of things. I think this could be a really handy way uh, to write your tests. Let's go ahead and move on to the second example, which is an object pool. Now, it's been a long time since I worked in a system that actually used an object pool, and last time I did, it was in Java. However, I put together a simple example here of how I imagine this might be able to happen. Now, the idea of an object pool is pretty simple. You're probably already familiar with it when it comes to database connections. The idea is that you keep a pool of database connections, say five open connections to a database, and then when you have uh, queries that need to be run within your application, you can request uh, an available connection 
from that pool and use it and make your query. And then when you're done with that connection, you return it to the pool and someone else can use it. And this is because there's often like an overhead time in setting up a database connection. And so you don't want to have to instantiate that run your query and then tear it down every time you have a query. You just want to be able to run the query and the pool can manage adding new connections. Maybe if one drops or if there's enough load that we need additional connections, it manages the pool and ideally removes a lot of the repeated overhead. This is also pretty common. I understand um, from talking to some of my friends in game development in the gaming world where you may have an object pool of vectors or points or something like that where you need to objects that you're frequently using to do a lot of math and you can easily just reset their state and you don't have to deallocate that memory and then reallocate more memory for points or for vectors uh, when you want to do that later on and so to do this instead of just using a function like we did in the last example i'm showing a pool class here and this can be a pool of any type t as long as t is some object that can be easily cleared or reset the state of that individual uh, instance in the pool uh, so you can reuse it later. So our pool object has an array uh, of elements in it and the constructor takes some count that is the number of items we expect to be in the pool and then a factory for creating that pool and so initially we can just fill up our pool in the constructor here as we loop over count number of times we create a t in the factory and we push it into the pool. Okay. So now getting is pretty simple. There are probably much more robust ways of managing a pool. I'm just going to pop it off when we take the item from the pool and then when we return it, actually return it to that array. So you can see we pop an element off the end of the pool. Of course, when you pop this value, it could be T or undefined. So we check to see if it is a value. We clear it to make sure it's ready for use and then we can return it. Uh, to the user. And then when they return the element to us, we can just stick it back to the beginning of the pool. So what is the object that we're going to pool? Well, we've got a summer class here, which allows us to sum values. And so we have a sum that we can keep track of. We have a way to clear that sum, right? And that is how it implements our clearable uh, interface here. And then you can add new numbers for it and get the result. We're going to create a pool of one here, and you'll see why in just a second. We have a list of arrays of numbers that we want to sum up. And so for each one of those number arrays, we're going to get a new pool for each number. We're going to add it and then we're going to log the result. And then at the end, we return the value to the pool. Let's go ahead and do npm run start two, which is our second example. And you can see we get 6, 15, 24. When using our pool like this, it's critical that we remember to return the object to the pool, right? Because if we don't do this and the object is never returned to the pool, then we're going to run into the problem where the pool becomes empty. And so now what we want to do, I think, is instead of having to explicitly return the item to the pool, wouldn't it be great here if when our variable goes out of scope, it is automatically collected back into the pool? And this one is a little bit trickier than our mock example, right? Because the pool object is not what we need to do dispose right the pool object is not what goes out of scope instead it's t which in our case is summer here summer is the value that needs to have the dispose function in it it's not really just clearing that we need to do on dispose we actually want to return the object to the pool we want to make it accessible once again to our users what we have to do is a little bit hacky i think i'd be interested to see from you guys in the comments if there are other ways we could do this but here's my approach so I have this interface disposable here. For some reason, Node.js isn't pulling in the public one for me in my setup here. What we want to do is say our pool is an array of T intersected with disposable. When we're filling up our pool, we have our T from the factory. And let's create a new value here called T prime, um, which is just T. But we're going to say T as, and I really do hate using as, but I think it, it makes sense in this case. T as T intersected with the disposables. What we can do now is go ahead and add our disposable function. And what we'll do here is we'll say uh, this dot pool dot on shift T prime. And why not just for good measure, we'll do T prime dot clear. So this is what happens when our T prime is disposed. We clear the object and then we put it back into the pool. And so now let's go ahead and push T prime into the pool. Okay, there's going to be a few other type errors we need to manage here. So first of all, this return function, actually, we don't need it at all anymore. Let's just drop that entirely. So obviously, if we run this now, we're going to get the same error, right? Empty pool. Why is that? Well, it's because we're not using using again. So if we stick using here, now we should see 6, 15, 24. Excellent. We're successfully returning our elements to the pool after we use them. This is, I think, an interesting example of how you can kind of extend an object 
uh, with disposable functionality uh, at runtime. I'd be interested to hear if there are cleaner ways to do this where we don't have to modify our T object. I think the only other way to do it would be to expect T to have that by default. And then T kind of has to know about the concept of being pooled. One thing I love about Summer here, and I know this is a simplistic example, but I think this is true about like database connections as well, in my understanding of them anyway, is that like it doesn't need to know that it is part of a pool or that it could be part of a pool, right? It can be used on its own or it can be used in a pool. And I would hate to have Summer have a constructor argument that is the pool that it's going to be a part of. And when you call dispose, it knows to put itself back in that pool. It feels like you're kind of cluttering the job of Summer up. And so that's why my preferred approach here is to kind of monkey patch uh, T prime here as we're sticking it into the pool with the ability to dispose itself. So I don't know, weigh in in the comments. What do you guys think of this approach? Let's look at one more example here. And that is the idea of a atomic unit of work or a transaction. Again, usually transactions are uh, familiar in the database context, but think of it like this. There is often um, multiple independent units of work that you need to do as part of a program that you want to be treated as a, a single unit of work in some way. And one thing that we're not going to talk about here is like rolling back or resetting partially completed work. But there is an interesting problem that I ran into recently where I had a couple of uh, calls I needed to make either to databases or to other external services. And then at the end of all that, I wanted to do uh, some side effects. I think it was like sending an email or a push notification or something like that, right? Things that I only want to do if all of the work completed successfully. And because of the nature of the code I was working in, I couldn't really just wait until the, uh, the end of all that work to trigger the side effects. I needed to be able to almost like enqueue side effects earlier on. And then later when the work was complete, okay, run any side effects if they were enqueued because there are certain cases where there were no side effects. This seems like an interesting way to use dispose to me. So here's a basic transaction class, right? It has two fields on it. We track whether or not this transaction has failed and then we have an array of tasks that we may want to complete at the end of the successful transaction. And so there are two main things you can do here. You can run work and this is work that is considered part of the transaction and then you can also enqueue work to be run after the transaction if the transaction is successful. So pretty simple. We've got a try catch here for our run. We can call our callback. If there is an error, we're going to set failed equal to true and then we can throw that error. You can also enqueue work, which also just takes a callback that returns a promise here. And then this is just being pushed onto a tasks array for future running if the task is successful. And so now we have this done function, which is pretty straightforward. If this transaction has not failed, then loop over all of the tasks and one by one, we're going to run those. And so now in our example here, we create our transaction and we enqueue a possible side effect to run, right? Sending our success email. And then we await run some business logic here, right? And this is simple. We're just checking to see if one plus one equals two. If it is, this was a successfully completed job and we'll go ahead and call T done. If it fails, we're going to throw here. Then when we call done, we should see because this stuff failed is true, then we don't run those tasks. If we do NPM uh, run start three, the work is done and then we send the success email. If we were to change this, one plus one does not equal two, so our work will not complete successfully, then we just get work failed. We never sent the success email. This is a neat way to almost have like a, a successful side effects queue at the end of your transaction. But we have to call T done. And wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to call T done? It's actually pretty simple here. What we can do instead is replace the name of the done function with a symbol dot. In this case, we need to use async dispose because this is an asynchronous function. So there's a different symbol for that. If we want to use async and await within our dispose, we need to use async dispose. Of course, this is not enough on its own because remember, so we should get our side effects. And of course, right now we're not getting our side effects. And that's because we need to use the using keyword when we create our transaction object. The syntax here is a little bit weird. Instead of just saying using, so notice we do get a TypeScript error here and saying the initializer of a using declaration must be on an object with a symbol.dispose or null or undefined. And this is not symbol.dispose, it's symbol.async dispose. The problem is we need to use await using T. I don't love the syntax. It's a little bit weird to say await here, I think, when there's not actually an await going on here, right? This is just calling a synchronous constructor. To be fair, I don't really understand what's going on behind the scenes there. So maybe there's a good reason for async here. I guess also there's like this implicit await happening here 
right? Which is that now that this scope is ending, we're going to need to do some asynchronous work to clean things up. And so I guess it makes sense to say there is an await somewhere, but it's not really here. I don't know. What do you think? Okay, so with that in mind, now we can do our run three again. And there we go. Work done. Send successful email. We've built this little transaction with side effects queue on the side built in. Those are three simple examples of how I've been thinking about the using keyword and the explicit resource management that we get in TypeScript 5.2. I'd love to hear about your interesting examples that aren't just file handlers and database connections because yeah, those feel obvious, but I'm sure there's more creative things we can do with this. So let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.